How many have you forgiven today? Chapter 27, For What It's Worth, Part 1. I'm so sorry to have to cut this visit short, but I have an upcoming meeting I must attend. Celestia says, as Anon and her exit Fancy's home. It's no trouble, Princess, I assure you. We've covered all the important topics. The rest is just filler for the event. He says, giving her a bow. I'm confident you have everything under control. This year's festival is going to be great. Well then, I must assure that I live up to your expectation, princess. Now, please don't allow me to keep you here any longer. Good day to you both. Later, Fancy. Anon gives him a small wave. With that all sorted out, Fancy leaves Anon and Celestia alone in front of his home. Anon lets out a long, tired sigh. They've been there for hours, and the entire conversation was as boring as he thought it would be. They talked about what various stands would be there, entertainments and food, even how much everything would cost. Not to mention that due to the increase of contestants and visitors alike, they needed to move the festival to the Colosseum this year, as it was the only place large enough for everything. A few times, Anon was brought into the conversation by Fancy Pants asking him if his shop was interested in having a stance this year and things of that nature. Anon kept up a front for him and simply told him that he should ask Bonbon, bon, as she handled all that paperwork stuff. Eventually, Fancy's wife showed up and Anon found her far more interesting than all the boring business stuff they talked about, mostly because she didn't look like any pony he's seen before. Compared to most ponies, she was very slender and even taller than other mares. Sure, she couldn't compare to the sisters, but she was arguably the same height as Cadence. It's of no surprise to Anon that some ponies can vary in shapes and sizes, but it's always interesting for him to see a pony that stands against the rest. Hell, he has a Philly-sized mare that's his head chef at the shop, so he knows how much these ponies can vary in size. After talking with her for a while, she seemed to be a rather nice pony. She held herself well, spoke with confidence, and was polite. So Anon found an interesting pony to talk with while Celestia and Fancy conducted business. Anon found out that she's a big fan of the candy he makes and that Fancy buys her a set of chocolates whenever he passes by on business. Though she did admit that indulging was a bit of a detriment to her figure as she's a model. Anon never really thought about it, but it makes sense that ponies have models too. He can admit that she's rather unique and probably really attractive to ponies. After a few hours, things were finally calming down, and Celestia noticed the time. So, here they stand now. All in all, it was an alright visit. Certainly could have been far more boring than it was. <sighs> that went on longer than I originally planned. I'll have to visit the other shops at a later date. We need to head back to the castle for my meeting. Celestia states. Celestia takes off towards the castle and Anon follows behind her. So what's this meeting about anyways? Anon asks, interested. Various things. The trading of goods between nations. Though, what it all boils down to is the control over land. Celestia says, seriously. It happens every year. The discussion of borders and who owns what. Sometimes leaders will attempt to claim more than they own, or sneakily place soldiers onto another leader's borders, playing it off as a mistake. Then a long discussion happens, riddled with the underlying threat of war if someone doesn't get their way. It's more of a test of wills, and each meeting ends the same way. Everyone mentally exhausted and no changes being made. Huh. Anon wasn't expecting to hear all that. Still. Celestia pulls Anon to her side with a wing. If you're up for it, I'd like to have you there with me. Are you sure that's alright? Anon asks, unsure if he should be involved with something so important. I certainly don't mind. Anon gets the feeling he may not have a choice in this matter. If it's alright, I guess I have no reason to say no. He says with a shrug. Celestia smiles at him and gives him a nuzzle. Thank you. Not to mention that my sister will be there to help as well. So it shouldn't be that long of a meeting. Oh, great. 
Anon has a feeling that this meeting is going to last for hours. However, it's far too late for him to back out now. At the very least, it should be interesting for him to see what Celestia has to deal with in her life. So maybe this will help grow their friendship even more. You're joking, right? Spike asks Luna with a forced chuckle. Luna shakes her head sadly. This isn't something she wants to do, but it's a necessary evil to ensure that mare will never harm Anon again. I'm afraid this is not a joke, Spike. Everything I've told you is true. The friends you've made, the mare who took care of you most of your life, all of them have done horrible things to someone who has done them no wrong. That is what happened on that day in Ponyville. The elements of harmony were punished for the crimes. This is why you and Twilight were brought back to Canterlot. Spike is frozen in place as he looks at Luna. Slowly, like a poison, it starts to sink in. Spike finds himself thinking back to all the times Anon came over to borrow a book. How he'd ask if Twilight was around, leaving if she was, or quickly grabbing a book if she wasn't. Most of the time, he'd leave the book he borrowed on the steps of the library, or even quickly handed it to Spike if they passed one another on the street. Spike always found it odd, but didn't think much about it. He knew that Anon changed on the day Twilight took him down into the basement. Before then, while he was a bit weird, he at least talked to Spike every so often, and seemed like an alright guy. Spike, for the most part, just assumed his change of behavior was something human-related, and didn't think much past that. Then, that day came when Twilight came home crying. She told Spike that they had to go back to Canterlot. Shining was even there, but he didn't tell Spike anything about why they were leaving, only that he should pack whatever he wanted to bring back with him. This entire time, Spike has been kept in the dark by the ponies he thought he knew. They always do this to him. Treat him like a baby as if he can't understand anything. Spike could feel tears falling from his eyes. He quickly uses his hands to clear them as he looks at Luna with a blank expression. Thank you for telling me, princess. You shouldn't thank me for telling you such things. I'm certain it's a tough pill to swallow. At least some pony was willing to tell me. Spike turns away, as he feels more tears welling up in his eyes. I, uh... I think I need to be alone for a little. Luna nods at that. Very well. See you later, Spike. Spike doesn't respond as he walks away towards the room Twilight and him are staying in. Luna can do nothing more than watch Spike as he leaves. This is a necessary evil. At least that's what she keeps telling herself. <laughs> when they call me a monster? A voice chuckles inside of Luna's mind. Luna grits her teeth at hearing Nightmare's remark. Still, she doesn't lash out at her. She's right, after all. What Luna did was done purely to hurt Twilight. To take away her last bastion of hope and peace. To truly bring her down to a level she never thought possible. Then, and only then, as she crawls amongst the dirt with nothing but sorrow and anguish lining her hearts, can she be given the privilege of asking for Anon's forgiveness. Any mare that dares to harm Anon will be dealt with. Luna states as she walks off towards the library where Twilight is. There is no doubt in Luna's heart that this will come back to bite her one day. But she doesn't care. This is what she believes is right. And no matter the consequence, she will follow her heart. Twilight has spent more than a few hours thinking over the task Luna has given her. To say it's a difficult one is putting it lightly. It almost seems like a joke of some kind. Who cares why Nightmare Moon did what she did? Isn't the fact that she did something wrong enough for every pony? Twilight feels the pain inside of her flare-up. Well, she's done something wrong too, and thought it was for the right reasons. Maybe Nightmare Moon was the same in that regard. Perhaps that's what Luna's testing her to find out. Twilight flips open the story of the sisters. Now that she reads it over, the story is rather vague about a lot of things. Then again, it is a book intended for fillies and cults. Twilight even thinks back to her brief encounter with Nightmare Moon. 
but there was very little she learned about her, other than she wanted to bring forth Night Eternal. So in that regard, it's similar to the children's book. Twilight peers over at the other books Luna left her. Many of them are history books from that era. Twilight pulls one book from the stack and flips it to a random page. Her eyes widen as she looks at a picture of Luna, but this isn't like any picture she's ever seen before. She's adorned in armor, from head to hoof, a long thin blade resting near her hind end. She's turned away from the camera and is looking off into what appears to be a battlefield. Her face is locked into a stone-like expression as fire burns just on the horizon. Twilight reads the text below as it reads, Princess Luna, the general of the Lunar Knights, keeps a vigilant eye for possible enemy ambush as her allies rest. Twilight has heard brief talk about Luna's involvement with various wars, though she's never looked too deeply into it. Twilight flips to another page at random, and starts to read a hoof-written passage of some kind. To see my princess on the battlefield has left me both humbled and terrified. Though I do not fear her. Yet, to recount the way she moves in battle can bring even the most stallion of ponies to their hawks. It's beautiful in a way. How she moves through battle as if dancing at the gala. Her movements are obscured by a film of darkness that follows her and foes fall without so much as a chance to cry out in pain. Yet as she fights, she ensures no friend of hers is struck by her blade. Every thrust is made with intent, and every foe who falls is given no chance to strike back. It's slow and gentle in a way. This is how a life is taken. This is but one passage but Twilight can clearly see dozens, if not hundreds, more. From a brief scan, many of them recount other battles in which Luna was able to cut down an entire battalion on her own. However, one of the letters stood out from the others. Its hoof writing was much finer than all the others. To Twilight's surprise, it was Luna's own letter. Today was an especially hard day. We've lost so many of our own, and there is nothing I can do about it. Many campaigns litter this land, and only one of me to take up the sword. I try the best I can. I've forgone sleep to save as many as I can, but I am no divine entity. I tire like them, and my magic is starting to fade as exhaustion grows. All I have is my blade at this point, but I will continue to fight. To save as many as I can. Twilight shivers some in place at reading this. Luna didn't have her magic as she fought? That means she could have been injured the entire time, and yet her skill was enough to carry her through countless battles. All for the sake of her own ponies. Is this what it takes to be a leader? Or is this something else entirely? Twilight goes back to the tale of the two sisters, and looks over the artwork. Now that she's looking closer, it doesn't look like the ponies are entering their homes to sleep. They actually look terrified. I can only guess that it takes a lot to be a leader, but that definitely shows it. Anyways, let's get on to our leaders of donators. Top donators are 630, Badass Waffle, Only One Thing, Saru Orion, and Iron Sky. Darkside, Raiden, Narwhals, Black Moon, Heart, Pastel Skies, Austin Rollins, Stu Hex, Sword, Feather, Mordor, Library, Rune, Slack, 9852, Will, Chris, Swinky, Rise, Soul, Shadow Moon, Luigi88, Chancellor Crest, Pixmoke369, Jesse Smith, Bobcat, GGF, and many more amazing people. Thank you all so much for watching this video and live life to the fullest.